If you've ever lived or worked on a farm before, you know that there's almost a countless number of different things that need to be done, and it's almost hard to decide what exactly needs to be done first. But if you'd asked me back in my younger years how I decided what needed to be done, I would have had a very simple answer for you, whatever dad says. And indeed, that was the truth of the matter because Dad oftentimes had exactly what we were going to do that day. And there were a couple of reasons for this. First, I didn't want to suffer the consequences if I didn't do those things. That I didn't want to miss out on anything fun that the family might be doing, so I didn't want to undergo any sort of punishment. But the second one was a much more noble reason, that in fact, Dad was very wise. Oftentimes, whenever he said something to do, it was the case that it needed to be done. If he said to go out and cut the grass, it needed to be cut. If he said to go out and mend a fence, it was because that fence was to the point of breaking. If he said we needed to go cut, rake, and bale a field, it was because that field was at its prime time and it was ready to go. That indeed, Dad often proved that following whatever he said that needed to be done was the right way. But are we still convinced with God our Father? Many times we might find ourselves at odds with God, and indeed we live in a culture and a society that oftentimes finds itself at odds with God, that it finds itself trying to do whatever it wants, even though God is always asking for that one simple thing, to be docile and open and to follow His will. But why is it so difficult? Why, are, why might it be a struggle? And what are we to do whenever it comes to being docile to God's will and following His commands? We start off this morning with the book of the prophet Ezekiel, and Ezekiel is serving strictly as God's mouthpiece, so we hear him start out with this phrase that the Lord says. And so we know that he's speaking very clearly from what exactly the Lord is saying. And so he says right off the bat that the house of Israel, that all of the Israelites are saying, the Lord's way is not fair. And it's rather shocking and riveting that they would say that, but it's actually not a phrase that might be all that uncommon, because in our day and age, there are similar phrases that mean the same exact thing. God is mean. He asks too much. That his way doesn't seem to be the right way. That it's something that is still an identifiable phrase, something that's still there today and persists now. But then, then the Lord is speaking through Ezekiel and he says, Hear, O house of Israel, is it, not that my, is it that my way is unfair or not your ways unfair? And this is rather striking and it's rather odd. It might cause the Israelites to stop and to think for just a second. And the Lord goes on to illustrate his point. He says that if a virtuous man turns from the way of the Lord and commits iniquity, it is because of the iniquity he must die. And so that right there is where the Israelites stop. That they see that one thing, they see the consequences of actions, and they say, the Lord's way is not fair. Look at what he does to this virtuous man. But the Lord is very clear. It's because of iniquity that this man dies. But there's a catch. What if the man repents? What if the man says sorry? What if he says that he wants to be reconciled with God his Father? Then things change. Then all of a sudden, that virtuous man will no longer die, but he will live because he has renounced all the sins he has committed. He has turned from his wicked ways and has returned to the Lord. That in fact, the Israelites were only operated on strict justice. They were used to, if you sinned once, you were cut off and ostracized from the community. But God, in fact, operates differently. You might be cut off for a while, but if you return to him, he always accepts you back. And so his way is not only fair, but it's super eminently fair, that it is above fair in every way. And so he's trying to illustrate to the Israelites that singular point. And then we move on and we hear from St. Paul in his letter to the Philippians. As he's addressing the Philippians, he notices that they're already doing a lot of things well, that they are receiving the Spirit, that they are practicing mercy and forgiveness. They're doing a lot of things, but he wants them to do just a little more. That he wants them to practice unity as well. That that is the last thing that would really bring joy to the heart of St. Paul. So he's wanting them to practice all of these charitable things in the Lord and in unity. And so that's one of the encouragements he gives. 
But then he also transitions it by saying that he wants them to be selfless, not to be seeking vain glory, glory or selfish ambition, but rather to be looking towards the body of Christ and to be looking past themselves, but looking to serve one another. But then he continues on because he wants them to exemplify Christ in every way. But then he says that this might be something that is hard to grasp, but he wants to flesh it out. So he goes into what Christ was, that though he was in the form of God, he did not deem equality with God something to be grasped at. Rather, he emptied himself, taking on himself the form of a slave and the appearance of a human being, and in fact, the nature of a human as well. So he goes on and he highlights how Jesus has suffered and died for all of those who would follow him, and then he indeed rises again, and he, because of that, enjoys glory, so much so that anyone who shares in the body of Christ will also share in that same glory, the same glory that is given to God the Father through Jesus Christ. So he encourages the church to unity, but he encourages them also to follow the example of Christ. And then we move on and we hear from the gospel, and we hear that Jesus is speaking to two particular parties of people, the chief priests and the elders of the Jewish community. And he's speaking to them particularly because they're oftentimes the ones who get it wrong. They're the ones who say the right thing, but oftentimes they're not doing the right things. That they will go out and preach a good message, but at the end of the day, they just simply live as they want to. And so Jesus is addressing this message to them. So he tells about a father who had two sons. He goes to the first son and tells him, son, go out and work in the vineyard today. The son says, I will not. I want to simply stay back at the house and do what I want to do. And he does that at least for a while, but then we notice his conscience starts to get the better of him, that it starts to convict him and tell him that he should follow the will of his father. So he eventually goes and he works in the vineyard. The father goes to the second son at the same time and he says, you two go into my vineyard and work today. And that son says, okay, I'll do it. But at the end of the day, he does not. Instead, decides to stay home and do whatever he pleases. So Jesus asks this question to the chief priests and the elders. He asks them, which one did the Father's will? And they indict themselves by saying, the first one. Because notice what Jesus does right after that. They know what the right thing to do is. They know what the God is asking of them. But then Jesus goes on. He says, Amen, I say to you, tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of heaven before you. How strong a statement, how bold, that Jesus would throw that in their face and say the ultimate of sinners, these two parties that had stereotypes of being the absolute worst of humanity, they're entering into heaven before the chief priests and the elders. It's striking, but it's true. Because he goes on to explain himself. He says, the tax collectors and prostitutes, whenever John the Baptist came pre preaching the way of repentance, those that were in power, the chief priests and the elders, they didn't listen. They might have heard it. They said they heard it. They would go and obey, but they didn't. But the tax collectors, they heard it. Initially, they weren't following the right path, but eventually they decided they wanted to follow the Lord and his path, and so they did. And so they enter the kingdom of heaven, that they actually accomplish the will of the Father, and they enter into eternal reward because of that. But then there's a question that we should start off with here. Which of the sons are we? Which of those two men that were standing before their father do we identify most with? Because one of them at the end of the day does the right thing, the other one does not. That one of them, though he gets things wrong, he eventually does what he is supposed to do. But which one do we identify with? Because oftentimes it can be very tempting to be the one that says the right thing, but at the end of the day it kind of lives life as we want to. We just simply go on our whims, our desires, all of the things and thoughts in our hearts. We just simply live those indifferent to God's will. But what about the other one? Because oftentimes that one is more of a reality to us. That oftentimes we may not exactly follow exactly at the first moment. We might not follow right out of the gate. But eventually we find ourselves attracted to the will of God. And then we start to follow and really accomplish that will in a more powerful way. And indeed, that's the question that's at play. But with that question, there's a few considerations we should make. First, that the will of God is a good thing. That the will of God in my life and in your life is going to accomplish our full fulfillment, our total joy, our total happiness, and total peace and security. That the will of God is going to bring about all of those things in life. Maybe not immediately, but in time, it will bring us to where we want to be. But we have to believe that. 
because that first son, he initially didn't think the will of God was going to bring him to that place of happiness and fulfillment, but eventually he decided maybe it will, and so he went and worked. But then the other ones who decided they were just going to give lip service to God and then simply do their own thing, they decided the will of God was not going to bring them happiness. So they lived as they desired, and eventually they fall into eternal ruin and desolation. But rather, the will of God is something that's going to bring us happiness and fulfillment. If we truly trust it, if we truly believe it and follow it to the best of our ability, it is going to bring us to a place of happiness, light, and peace. Now, to be clear, there will be moments where we might be tempted to doubt. There might be moments where bad things happen to good people. There might be moments where we wonder, why is God so mean? Why is he not fair to me? And though we may not have the answer right at that moment, we have to trust even more that the will of God is going to lead us to our fulfillment. It's going to lead us to where we want to be and where we want to go. St. Jose Maria Escriva, whenever he's speaking about the will of God, he says that there are four different stages whenever we follow, lest we think that we're already following the will of God and doing that totally. That in fact, there are different stages of ascent to the will of God. And it, want, it begs that question of where we are, but also where we can be in time. First is to relinquish ourselves to the will of God. It's a reluctance at its best, but it nonetheless recognizes the will of God is there and it's overpowering, so I might as well just do it. And it's that first stage, that it is us following the will of God, but it's rather reluctant, but nonetheless we relinquish to it. And then there is the next step, and that is conforming to the will of God, recognizing there might be something more to this will. There might be something more to his plan and to his design for me, and therefore I'm going to conform. I'm going to try to get into a little more synchronization with that will. And then the third, we start to recognize the goodness. We start to want the will of God. We start to see that even in the times whenever evil or bad things happen, even in the moments where it might not seem to pan out exactly, that we still know that the Lord is working in our midst. That he's going to bring everything, and he's even going to bring good out of the bad things that happen to us. Therefore, we start to want the will of God because we recognize we're not in control, but God is. And then finally, we learn to love the will of God. And that is the pinnacle. That is where we want to be. That is the absolute climax of where we desire to find ourselves in relation to God's will. Because we learn that God's will is going to provide everything for us. It's going to give us full fulfillment, full happiness, full joy, peace, and security in this life and in the next. It's going to lead us to the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, we learn to love the will of God because it brings us into greater communion with him. And that's the fourth stage. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to be in that fourth stage right now. Maybe we're in one of the first two, but that's okay because that means that we're progressing along the way of life, and that means that we're coming into communion and synchronization with that will. It means that we recognize the goodness and the beauty of God's will and design and plan in our lives, and that's where we want to be. But the second thing that we should realize is that many times in life we are going to fail, that we might be like the tax collectors and prostitutes in the fact that we might have done wrong, or we might have moments where we're not fully in conformity with God's will. And so in those moments, we might start to despair, that we might start to find ourselves in a place where we wonder, can we come back into communion with God? And there might be a pitfall here as well, that if we get so far gone, that sometimes we might start to say, well, the will of God is not fair, because we convince ourselves that we cannot return to the Father. But we can. That's the truth of the gospel, that he is a God of mercy and compassion, and he is a God of forgiveness. And so he tells us that even in our worst moments, even in the worst of stereotypes, even the tax collectors and sinners could return to him if they simply relinquish control of their sins, if they cast all of those things at the foot of the cross, then indeed they know that they can find forgiveness and they can find themselves pursuing God's will yet again. And so that is the second thing. Even though we're not perfect, even though at times we might falter at finding God's will in our life and trusting in it very fully, nonetheless, the Lord always gives us that chance to continue to return to him and to seek his will yet again. And then the final consideration that we should have this week as we behold the gospel. Where is the Lord follow, calling you to follow his will more closely right now? Where is that place of doubt? 
Where is that place of confusion? Where is that place of that voice that's whispering that God doesn't care? Or maybe that God doesn't know the fullness of this situation. Where is the place where the Lord is asking you to step out on the water? Where he's asking you to trust in his will just a little more fully? That each and every one of us in this church, I dare say, have an individual and unique way where the Lord is calling us out. Where he's asking us to give over to his will. To give over and to trust his plan for us in a more full way that each and every one of us have just one specific area that we can work on this week. And perhaps that's the homework that we should have. Because at the end of the day, those two sons, one of them did the right thing, even though at the outset he didn't quite get it right. At the end of the day, he wound up in the right place. The other one did not. But we want to be the son who gets it right eventually, who follows the will of God and trusts it fully for our, will, for our entire lives, not just in this life, but in the life to come. Because maybe that's the beauty of life on the farm and what I alluded to very early, very early on in this homily. The fact that the, my dad, even though at times his will was inconvenient, sometimes it caused me hardship and sometimes it caused me to do things I didn't really want to do. At the end of the day, it was exactly what needed to be done. And it led to a place of fulfillment and it led to a farm that worked well. And indeed, that's the challenge and the encouragement for each and every one of us. That at times, God's will may be hard to follow. At times, it may be difficult. But nonetheless, in this day and age, it is something of a virtue for us to continue to follow the will of God and to trust it day in and day out. Our world at large doesn't really believe in that. It doesn't want us to look much further than ourselves. But we know that happiness only lies in following the will of God and trusting Him to the end of time. My brothers and sisters... There were two brothers that day. One got it wrong, the other got it right. Let's be that brother that got it right. Let's be the ones that continue to see the will of God. And even in the times of imperfection, we continue to renew ourselves in pursuit of God and His holy will that will lead us to the happiness of the halls of the kingdom of heaven.